All right, thank you so much, uh, Ronnie. It's such a, a privilege for me to be here with you guys. Um, thank you for allowing us to talk to your team. Uh, once again, I'll say kudos to the welfare department. Not many entities out there uh, as concerned about their staff like you guys have done by organizing this forum in which we get to do uh, a presentation on something that is extremely pertinent in the times that we are living in. Uh, together with my colleague Mimi, we have had several of these conversations um, on different forums. And um, as always, we are, we are always excited to have this conversation. Um, may I say that um, uh, the issue of wills has increasingly become um, a topic, a, 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 should I say, a, a topical conversation in the times that we live in. Uh, as we all know, the pandemic has uh, really affected people uh, far and wide, and quite a number of people have passed on, have, have since passed on. And my pre prediction is that after the pandemic happens, uh, when the dust has settled, we, we are bound to see quite a number of people uh, go to law courts uh, over issues to do with succession, eh? especially where individuals do not leave wills. And so it's very important for you and I, not only to have this conversation, but to encourage people around us, if you're your family members, uh, your friends, uh, to be very prudent. And so our call today is a call of prudence regarding this subject to do with uh, a will. Um, as we make our presentation today, our presentation is going to be, is going to be structured in a question and answer form. Uh, we have already a few slides that have questions that have been lined and uh, Ronald here will uh, uh, be sharing some of those slides here and uh, I'll be responding. And I hope that uh, uh, you guys will be able to ask questions at the end uh, regarding the different things we would have talked about. So the will, what is a will? Uh, a will uh, can be defined as a legal, a legal document that is uh, drafted by an individual, that can be you and I, that lists down in detail uh, their, uh, your wishes or one's wishes. Uh, it, can, it can include uh, you know, assets or property uh, or interests that you may have. Uh, and then it, can, it, it also clearly indicates to whom these uh, things that you own are going to be distributed to. And uh, I will briefly uh, make a few definitions regarding uh, what a will, uh, regarding what involves a will. Uh, the first definition is a testator. A testator is a person who drafts the will. Uh, that is you and I. And this has to be a person who is uh, of the age of 18, 18 years uh, and above. And they ought to be a person of a sound mind. Yes, a person of a sound mind. Uh, the second question, uh, the, the second definition is um, uh, when one has drafted a will, who we have just called it a stator, uh, what happens then? That will has to be witnessed. And the people who witness or sign the will are called witnesses. Yes, they are called witnesses. And their role and responsibility is to attest the, the, the contents of the will. In, in, in a way, it is to say to witness the, right, the will, they are to witness the will that the testator has written. Uh, within the will, it's important you include a person called an executor. An executor is an individual who uh, is to implement your wishes upon your death. Upon one's death, the executor's role is to bring out the will and implement one's wishes as listed in that will. And so it's not the witnesses, but it is the executor. There's a distinction between witnesses and the executor. Uh, the other notable definition is the beneficiary. 
the beneficiary are persons that will benefit from the will, from the distribution upon one's demise. Now, this could include the surviving spouse or the children. Uh, among other things uh, uh, to be defined is dependents. Uh, you may include dependents in your will. Dependents, uh, these include parents, uh, step, you know, step parents, or grandparents, or grandchildren, or stepchildren, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Any individual that was dependent on your survival or people who you are su uh, supporting in the course of your existence. So once again, let me define what a will is. A will is a legal document drafted by a testator. Remember who a testator is? A testator, that, you know, the owner of the estate, yes. It is a legal document drafted by a person or a testator, like I, I, I've already defined, uh, expressing their wishes, expressing their wishes on how to distribute their estate upon their demise. So who can make a will? I've already said a person who is of sound mind and who is above the age, who is of the age or above the age of 18 years. Do I need to make another will after marriage? Um, yes and no. First and foremost, uh, if you make a will uh, while you're single and then uh, yeah, perhaps next year you get married, uh, the will that you would have made before you got married uh, has got to be uh, revoked and you'll have to draft a new will or you'll have to write a codicil including the new changes and attach it to the uh, existing will. Alternatively, if you make a will in contemplation of marriage and uh, you eventually get married to that person who you contemplated uh, to get married at the time you were uh, drafting uh, the will, that will that you would have made is valid. I don't know if that makes sense. If you make a will in contemplation of getting married to B and then you eventually get married to B, that will that you would have made is still valid. Uh, do I need to be a tycoon to make a will? No way. You don't need to be a tycoon to make a will. If you have your small guitar and it's your most prized asset in the house, you can write a will and categorically state in the will to whom that guitar is going to go to. You're never too uh, rich or too poor to make a will, it's important you make a will, you write a will. Uh, what can be considered as worth passing on to beneficiaries? Anything, any asset, any item you own is worth uh, uh, um, uh, passing on to beneficiaries. Um, even if you have, for example, um, a social media account, Perhaps uh, one of you is uh, uh, an Instagram hot shot. Eh? It can also be included in the will as one of the things you can pass on to a beneficiary. Who is an executor and maker of a will? Like I said earlier on, an executor is a person who essentially ensures that uh, the, your wishes are implemented, the wishes in the will are implemented, are implemented. That is who an executor is. I already defined who a maker of a will is. I said a maker of a will is called a testator. That's you and I, any common person. As long as, like I said, is an adult of sound mind. How many witnesses are needed when the will is being signed? Remember we talked about the fact that witnesses are very important when you write a will. Ronald and Helen, need to witness the will that has been drawn by Harris. They need to be like, yes, we saw Harris. Yes, we were, Harris brought this will to us. We read through it, that we read the content of the will and that, you know, and then you get, and then they get to sign. They both don't have to be present, but it is important that when they are going to witness, the, uh, while they witness or when they are witnessing that will, they are, present. Now, that is to say, 
It's important that the, wit the number of witnesses does no is not less than two and can be as many as possible. So it's two or more witnesses. Um, the other question uh, that uh, uh, is common, that is commonly asked is, uh, can beneficiaries witness the signing? In other words, if Ronald has four kids, and I'm not saying Ronald has four sons, and Ronald drive, drafts a will, and he, uh, he has, he calls one of his boys, he, the, the, the firstborn to, to, you know, to be a witness, uh, is it valid or is it acceptable? Yes. However, it is important that if a beneficiary is a witness to a will, their witnessing of a will has got to be, again, witnessed by two independent, independent witnesses, two independent witnesses. Let me give an example. If, like I've said, Ronald's son is to witness the will that the father, Ronald, has written, Ron, Ronald will need Harris and Mimi to be present while Ronald Jr. is signing uh, uh, on the will or is witnessing that will. It is very important for purposes of validity of that will. And of course, the spirit behind it is the spirit of transparency. Because many a times you have wills that have been invalidated at the altar of court for justice simply because the witnesses are individuals that are beneficiaries to the estate. So court has sometimes uh, uh, questioned such wills and of course thrown them out. So to avoid that, it's important that the people who are witnessing your will are independent individuals, independent witnesses, people who will not benefit uh, from your estate. Who is an executor? Oh, that one I think I already answered. How to get independent witnesses that aren't beneficiaries? Well, I think the question was uh, wrongly framed, but I think I've uh, answered the question to do with independent witnesses. Does a will have to be proved to be valid? Yes, it has to be proved to be valid. It's essential that a will is proved to be valid. And this is how, and, and this is the, the process. What happens is when someone dies and they left behind a will, the executor is required to get that will along with the petition. We call it a form 78 and include an affidavit, which is form three. Get that band of documents, attach the original will, attach the two copies, of the original will and equally attach the death certificate of the person and then file them in court. And then court will proceed to validate the will. And then will the eventual, uh, the eventual result of that process is either you get a, a, a grant of probate which essentially validates the will or the, uh, the court will raise questionable uh, uh, findings if the will has problems. Can a will be modified? Yes, a will can be modified. It can be modified by a document called a codicil and the codicil has to be dated. A codicil is like adding, a, what? It's like an adding an attachment to the will. There is already a will, but a codicil is like an extra paper you get to attached to that document. It has to be dated. The details of that codicil that are amending or changing some certain aspects of that will have to be very specific. And the same has to be signed and witnessed. Yes, so a will can be modified. Next uh, slide. Next slide, yes. So what are factors that can cause a will to be invalidated? One is fraud. A common example of fraud I would uh, point out is, um, and I'll give another example. You have uh, two boys and uh, one of them uh, tells the father, so-and-so, uh, maybe uh, Adam, Adam, uh, mm -hmm 
did A, B, C, D. And uh, the information that this boy is telling the father is wrong information. Yeah. And as a result, it causes the father to change the will in favor of him. Only for only later for I, I, only only later for uh, you know those facts to be proved wrong. Uh, that can be a ground for invalidation of a will. Because if, for example, a, the writer of a will, or if that father is going to disinherit that child for things that have, been said, that have been said about that child, in the will, he has to be categorical and say, hey, I'm, dis I'm disinheriting uh, uh, Adam because of A, B, C, D. And if it turns out that that information was fraud or was wrong, uh, it can be a ground of fraud to uh, invalidate the will. There are many aspects of fraud, but that's one of uh, the common ones that sometimes we have uh, uh, seen or we have encountered. Um, the other ground on which a will can be invalidated, it is under circumstances where the testator is under coercion. Forcing some to, someone to make a will, that's a common one. You force an old man, to draft a will, and in, in there you 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 know you you cause him to to you know to make such declarations that he should you know half of his entire estate goes to you. If I don't know what status you would be, maybe a child or maybe a grandchild, whichever. But the point being, under those circumstances, a will can be invalidated. The other grounds are where there is uh, serious mistakes while making the will. Such mistakes can include where maybe the drafter of the will did not uh, uh, sign the will or the dependent, uh, sorry, the, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the witnesses did not properly witness the will. Those are grounds on which a will can be invalidated. Having only one witness, Yes, that can invalidate a will. Realize there have to be two witnesses. It's a legal requirement that there are two witnesses. Then lastly, uh, and very common, is also uh, where a person is of unsound mind. Sometimes wills have been invalidated because uh, there is medical proof that the person, at the time they were making the will, was, uh, were, were having bouts of, um, of, um, uh, of uh, dementia. He used to have episodes of dementia that tended to, uh, uh, you know, you know, make them lose their memory. So it makes the will questionable. And uh, that is my presentation on my end. I therefore I hand over to my very able um, and eloquent friend, Mimi. Mimi, you can take over from from where I've ended. Thank you, Harris, and uh, everyone for this amazing opportunity uh, to be here today and to share with you. I don't know if you guys can see my video feed. Um, yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so greetings to everyone once again. Uh, as Harris said, I'm Mimi. Uh, and uh, managing partner of this, I'm in the office, unlike Harris. Harris is in his uh, palace. So if you hear any children or chicken or something, long story, but uh, I'm in the office. So I'm just going to follow up from where Harris left off. Um, so what are the requirements uh, for making a will? Uh, so for a will, you need the full name of the maker. You had Harris talking about a testator. So the maker of a will, formally we call them a testator. So for you to get their full particulars, typically um, you require a copy of their national ID so that the names actually tally what you have on your uh, written will and what is attached to um, the will. Now that makes it so much easier when it comes to the attachment of other things like a burial permit um, and any other documents that are needed for the probate process. I remember. Harry said, probate process is the process uh, where your will goes to, uh, through court for it to be proven to be valid. So you also need, um, aside from the name and the particulars on the ID, you need um, 
the postal address of the maker, you need his full particulars, postal address, telephone number, and all that. The same thing that you need for your executors and your beneficiaries and your witnesses. The reason is it's easy to uh, also not only to draft your will, but also to get a hold of them when the maker dies. So when you die, whoever will be vested with the will, whoever will be keeping the will, we will be uh, what we call the custodian of the will will have an easier time getting hold of this person or these people so you need the full name of the executors and it's safer to have more than one in case one dies the other one just takes over as opposed to having none at, uh, one only um then you need the telephone number of the executor their current physical location um so that if they travel at least you have a telephone number but if you have their physical location it's so much easier uh, you need a full inventory of assets and liabilities. So um, Harris mentioned assets are like movable and immovable property. We're talking about parcels of land. We're talking about developments on that land being now like apartments, office structures, parking structures that you uh, developed, um, any kind of buildings that you set up, very important that we have a full inventory of immovable property. As well as removable property, we're talking about motor vehicles, uh, we're talking about shares in companies, we're talking about royalties that you're earning from uh, copyright works, um, priceless artwork, and so on and so forth. Then we have um, the full inventory of liabilities. So if you have loans, uh, as you're drafting your will, be sure to set out that you have loans that you need to pay, give the full particular. So when we're talking about also assets, we're saying, if you have a bank account at Barclays Bank or ABSA, and you have loans that you've also taken out from ABSA, you write your bank account details in full, your, the name of the account, if it's your full name, how it's been set out in, uh, when you are setting up the account, you need the account number, the branch name, the bank code and all those things, you set them out. If you'd like to set out also your bank balance uh, as of the time of uh, drafting the will, this will help with the probate process because later on we'll discuss where it is uh, that you file the probate uh, case. Uh, and this depends on the value of the estate. Um, so you also need to set out the, the same thing about your liabilities. If you have loans also at ABSA, you set out the value of the loan when it was taken out. Um, the bank typically will be able to give uh, details with regard to whether that was discharged or not. Um, but with regard to the bank balance, they will not be able to discharge any information or disclose any information until you have what is called a grant of probate, uh, which I'll get to a, a bit later. So the beneficiaries, you list all your beneficiaries, and this includes like what Harris talked about, your children, your spouses. Now, in our line of work, we don't judge. People have more than one spouse. They have a spouse, girlfriends, boyfriends, they have children in wedlock, they have children out of wedlock. It's important when you're drafting your will to set out all these people, why? Because later on, they can contest the validity of your will on the grounds that as beneficiaries, they were not provided for. Uh, so it's important, uh, don't worry about what they will say, you'll be gone. They will not be able to attack you or say anything to you directly. Um, so it's important to just set out all these things. Uh, to reduce the chances of people fighting in court and then the will is declared invalid. Also your witnesses, have the telephone numbers of the witnesses, the ID number, the full names of the witnesses. Um, this makes it so much easier for particularly us as advocates to get hold of them when it comes to the probate case, why? Because in proving the validity of a will, the witnesses are very, very important people. They are called to court and they are called to um, they are being questioned in court by the judge or the magistrate regarding the state of mind or your state of mind as the maker of the will during the time you are making the will. Uh, remember, he's talked about the things that avoid a will, uh, the state of mind, soundness of mind, coercion, fraud, mistakes. So they want to, the judges, the magistrates, they want to make sure that all these aspects have been taken care of so that they can declare the will to be valid. So the witnesses will be the ones to say, when Ronnie was uh, drafting the will, or when he was signing the will, I was present, I saw him, he was not in any pain. The pain did not hinder his mental status. He was not popping any prescription pills. They did not hinder his uh, status. He was not drunk. Uh, it did not hinder his mental status. Therefore, he was of sound mind. Um, so then who can be appointed as an executor of a will? 
same thing, someone who's over the age of 18, someone who's of sound mind and body, someone who's responsible and honest, someone who has not been adjudged a bankrupt. Because if you're bankrupt, you cannot be trusted with other people's finances, generally and across the board. Um, also, you want an honest person, someone who's responsible because they'll be charged with the responsibility of taking care of all your assets and taking care of your beneficiaries during the, the COVID process, all the way to the end where now they have to distribute the estate of the deceased person. So it's important that you get someone who's um, very responsible uh, and they know even how to approach the court. They will also be the ones in charge of collecting what is called collecting your estate. So wherever it is that your assets are, they'll have to make sure they put it all uh, together in one place and they do a full inventory of your assets so that they're able to draft uh, or get an advocate who can draft uh, the petition. For, if you have a will, it's called a petition for grant of probate with written will annexed. If you don't have a will, it's called a petition for letters of, admi uh, of administration intestate, which means uh, dying without a written will. So can a beneficiary be an executor? Yes, a beneficiary can be an executor. There's nothing that stops a beneficiary from being an executor. The only issue uh, when it comes to beneficiaries is when it comes to witnessing of the will. But executorship, there is no issue with that. Um, there's a section, a specific section um, uh, with regard to executorship, that's section six. Um, the thing about beneficiaries, an executor can also be a witness but a beneficiary cannot witness the will. Um, the independence aspect, the competency of it, it will uh, hamper the aspect of validity of the written will. So you want the will to be valid. At the end of the day, all these rules are so that you have a valid will in place at the point of your demise. Can I have more than one executor? Like I said earlier, it is the best thing to do, have two, um, so that if one should pass on or struggle with a mental health issue, or for one reason or the other, they choose not to be an executor. Uh, you can actually opt out even after the person has passed on. There is a whole process to it. Uh, it's rare, but it happens. And when it does, the courts give um, the person leeway to opt out of being an executor. So it's better to have two. Must the will be drawn by a lawyer? Not really. But I would say if you have to draw your own will, if you have to um, draft your own will, make sure that you take that will to a lawyer who knows what they're doing, uh, a family law practitioner, so that they're able to look through your will and question you on the aspects of validity so that they're able to tell you whether you need to redraft the will and do it afresh uh, with the rules uh, that are set out in what is called the Law of Succession Act or whether your will is fine and therefore it's ready to be stored uh, in a safe place. Where, uh, which is now the next thing, where do you keep a will? You keep it in a safe place. You keep it in a place with someone that you trust. Um, there are people who can destroy your will. So you have to keep it in a place that you can trust. Um, you keep it with maybe your spouse. If you trust your spouse, you can keep it with your lawyer. If uh, you have a lawyer, you can keep it in your bank. And so far as you have a written instruction with your bank that upon your passing, if they ever get to know that you passed on, they have to release the will for the reading of the will. Uh, you can keep it with the executors, which is also one of the best things you can do. So either your lawyer, your executor, even your pastor can keep your will, as long as it's in a safe place with a responsible person who will not change the contents of your will. It's very important that you trust this person because if you change the content of your will, then it amounts to fraud. Uh, some people tend to do that, you know, um, if you watch Suits, you know, these are things that happen, so, and it happens also in Kenya, so you need to make sure that your will uh, is intact, and that your wishes are set out as you desire um, the distribution of your property to be. Importance of informing family about the will, it's so that your wishes are respected at the end of your life. Um, you do not wish to have uh, family not know that there's a will in place because then what will happen is they will file your succession uh, matter as though there's no written will. So that's intestacy. So they get to determine how the property will be distributed. More often than not, you'll find maybe the first sibling or the one who is uh, well off getting more as opposed to now another sibling who is maybe of men has mental health issues you'll find younger children are losing out. So 
because they filed for intestacy. So it's important to inform somebody in your family that there is a written will in place, even if it's not everybody, inform at least one or two. Um, so that in the event of your demise, they know that there's a written will and they know exactly who has it, who is the custodian of that will. Can I give more to one beneficiary as, as compared to the rest? You can, but you'd have to explain it. And, it, and the amount, the ratio in which you distributed uh, to one compared to the rest, it has to be reasonable. The law provides that there has to be equitable, not equal, but equitable distribution of um, your, your assets or your estate among your beneficiaries. So if you give one 80% and, and then you have 10 other beneficiaries, be it your spouse, your children, or whoever else, and they are fighting over 20%, then the court will overturn that. So you will not be invalidated. You have to give equitable distribution of your estate. Can a estate be given to non-family members? Yes, you can give uh, part of your estate to non-family members. There is nothing stopping that. However, you cannot give the full estate to non-family members purely, purely. So when we're talking about non-family members, we're talking about churches, uh, schools, hospitals, libraries, um, museum, if you if you keep that kind of stuff in your house, um, maybe a music school, if you're a musician or you collect uh, certain items, maybe a photography studio, if you have expensive equipment that you want to give out. But remember, you have to prioritize your beneficiaries even as you do so. Can a will be oral and how can it be validated? Yes, section nine of the Succession Act provides for oral wills. Um, they have, you have to have uh, two, uh, or two competent, competent being they're over the age of 18, they are of sound mind and body, uh, and they are responsible people, of course, with good memory. I'll say with good memory because the oral will only has a lifespan of three months. A written will has a long lifespan of forever and ever until you revoke the will. But an oral will, um, after three months, it's not valid anymore. The reason is your witnesses need to be able to remember the contents of the oral will. So you cannot have people who are forgetful. Uh, you cannot have people who would possibly alter the will. So you need people who are responsible and trustworthy. And then you have to die three months after making the will. So it's better to have a written will. How can it be validated before the court? Those witnesses who are present, of course, now it's oral, there'll be no signing, they'll just be present, they'll nod their heads when you're done speaking, they ask you, are you sure? You say yes, and that's your oral will. They'll be called to court, the two of them. So what happens is uh, during the court session, one witness will be outside, the other one will be inside being questioned by the judge or the magistrate. They will give the contents of your oral will and the circumstances within which you validate, like what you said when you said, uh, okay, this is my last will and testament. Then they will ask the other witness to come in and the first one will leave and they'll compare notes. If at any point in time, the testimony of both witnesses, there is an issue with regard to the content, then your oral will will be validated. So there, it's a higher risk having an oral will than a written will. I'll give you also the example of Big Kev, uh, full name Kevin Obajo. He was um, the guy who had the brain tumor for the longest time. When he passed on, he recorded what was an oral will. And because our succession act is quite far behind, we do not have provision for recording oral wills. So it's important for you to just have a written will. Um, anything that's recorded will not be recognized even as an oral will. So um, next slide, please. So now to probate and letters of administration, what happens when a person dies without making a will? It goes into what I mentioned, section 34, intestacy. So intestacy is defined as, you know, um, dying without making a will, but also the circumstances when you die having written a will, but it is invalidated in court. So then you die intestate. The court will declare that you died intestate. So the very first part of having a written will is going through probate to validate the will. If the will is validated, fine, it goes on with the process. If it is invalidated, then it goes through the process of letters of administration in test it. So the, there's a whole process to it, um, which goes to the next question, next uh, letters of administration and requirements to apply for them. So what you need 
for the requirements to apply for letters of administration, um, of course, the death certificate, the person who's passed on, then you can attach a burial permit. It's, it's good if you have a burial permit. It's actually the best if you have a burial permit. If not, it's not going to hamper your uh, petition uh, in court. Um, you must have the requisite form. So there's the actual petition. Then you have an affidavit in support uh, of the petition and other uh, affidavits. You need a guarantor. And now these are things that now an advocate would be able to run you through. There are several forms, even with regard to um, filing uh, the petition when you have a written will. You need a guarantor always. Actually, two. You need two guarantors who sign the, the form for the guarantors and then they sign an affidavit as well. Uh, so that if anything happens to the estate, those guarantors now take the heat for it. So if the executors or the administrators uh, misuse the estate or let it go to waste, uh, then the guarantors will be called to court also to account for that. You also need a consent form. So the consent form is for the beneficiaries being the children uh, and the spouse. So if you have an administrator um, and you want to consent to that person who's not a family member, or even if it's a family member, being an administrator to their estate, the rest of them must sign the consent form saying that they do not contest this person um, filing let for letters of administration on their behalf. There is also another consent form later on where, where the uh, beneficiaries say they're not disputing uh, the mode of distribution of their estate. So how the distribution of the state has been done. Now, you know, when we were talking about in dying without making a will, there is no distribution by you. You did not set out how you want your state to be divided. So they have to divide it themselves. Um, and that's why we need the consent to the mode of distribution. Is there a fine to family? Um, oh, you also need uh, copies of the titles of the properties, they'll be attached. Um, so if you have parcels of land, even if it's a 50 by 80, you need a copy of that title to be attached as evidence that says, um, the deceased person owned that parcel of land. And most importantly, they do not proceed if you don't have a chief's letter. Um, every time we do this presentation with Harris, uh, people always ask about the, the letter of the chief. Is it that important? The Law of Succession Act has not done away with it. It's just for the chief to say this person actually existed in this particular area. They lived in this area, therefore, we can have the chief's letter. Now, what happens if you die in Loitoktok, but you resided in Nairobi? It is the chief in Nairobi, who, uh, in the particular area in Nairobi. So if it's Mbakasi, if it's Kilimani, if it's Karen, if it's Langata, if it's Runda, uh, I know possibly there are very wealthy people here by faith and also in, in real life. So they're giving us very good briefs. Thank you so much. Um, wherever it is you reside, that's where you're ordinarily resided up to the point of your death. That's where you get the chief's letter. So don't get it from your shags. Make sure you get it from the area where you ordinarily resided. So if you died elsewhere, uh, they bring your body here and then you get the chief's letter. Um, the, your people will get the chief's letter. Yeah? So your beneficiary is your spouse, your siblings if you don't have a spouse, uh, your children if your spouse also uh, may be separated with a passed on and so on and so forth. Is there a fine for family who begin to divide their state without letters of administration? There is uh, 10,000 Kenya shillings or imprisonment. So you want to be very careful about that. The actual offense is called intermeddling. So it's intermeddling with the estate of a deceased person. So you want to avoid uh, dividing their estate. And what is this dividing of the estate that people do? Um, they feel like they need to pay rent. So they go and withdraw money, uh, mobile banking, internet banking, or with the ATM pin. You kept seeing daddy putting the pin so you think you can go and put the pin. Uh, do not do that. That's called intermeddling and it's, uh, it's an offense. Uh, also, selling off uh, parcels of land. You hear the stories of uh, a man or a woman dying and then the siblings coming and uh, attempting to sell off parcels of land that uh, this person was given by their parents or their spouse. That's also intermeddling with the estate of a deceased. Um, family can also be uh, your mother, your father, your uh, uncle in the village. They hear someone has passed on in Nairobi, they come and pick spoons and clothes and shoes. That's also intermeddling. Um, there is a difference between your assets, by the way, and household goods. 
So the Law of Succession Act provides that households would exclusively go to your spouse. So in the absence of your spouse, they exclusively go to your immediate children. So those do not form part of your petition for letters of administration intestate or your petition for grant of probate with written will annexed. So if you have a will where you die without a written will, your sufuria in the house, your couch, your clothes, um, your cologne or your perfume, those are exclusively for your immediate uh, spouse or children. Uh, duties of admi administrator and how to pick one. Um, I think I mentioned some of the duties of administrator. They're the same as the duties of an executor. So they collect their estate when it comes to dividing their estate as per the desires of either your written will or what the court will declare is the method in which and uh, the mode of distribution, who gets what property. Um, they're the ones who are supposed to ensure that that happens as per what is called the confirmation of grant, the certificate of confirmation of grant. So that certificate lists out the beneficiary's names on one column, and then it has um, the properties that each is getting uh, in another column. So that's what the, the administrator or the executor is supposed to do. So if the state, uh, or oh, how to pick one, how to pick an administrator, very, very important. Just like I said, you're picking someone like an executor, same thing, responsible person, honest person of the, over the age of 18, someone who's never been bankrupt or insolvent. So insolvency is you're almost at bankruptcy, just so that they don't start paying off their own personal debts with the estate of the deceased person. So if the estate is more than 20 million, do I need to go to the high court? Yes. Um, if the estate is then less than 20 million, you need to go to the magistrate's court. It's what is called pecuniary jurisdiction of the court. So according to that uh, rule, the magistrate's court has a jurisdiction between one and 20 million, one Kenya shilling and 20 million Kenya shilling. And then uh, high court is over 20 million Kenya shilling. Now, how would you know that the estate of somebody is worth this amount? Remember, I've said if you're writing a written, if you're having a written will, do set out the exact values as at the time you're writing the will, which is also why we date the will. It's so that we can now look at it. If you had your last valid will, written will in the year 2018, and you owned a parcel of land in Lavington at that time, an acre was going for around 200 million. In 2021, it has appreciated by a certain percentage. So we can calculate the value and then know where we are filing it. If you had a 50 by 80 in Ruiru, we also need to calculate the same um, so that we're able to tell if it's worth 2 million, then you have uh, a bank account that has 10 million. So you're still within the bracket of the magistrate's court. So it's important for us. Uh, so we're able to know where to file your petition. Uh, also, remember I talked about where you die. So in the same way, there is also territorial jurisdiction of the court. So you need to know, one, the estimated value of the estate, and then two, where the person, uh, where the value, the largest value. Example to uh, Harris earlier, there's a client uh, who passed on, a client of mine, he had a large, lived in Nairobi, had a large chunk of his estate here in Nairobi, but one parcel of land worth 29 million was located. The value, the largest value, even if it's just of one item, is out in, in another jurisdiction. I, I don't know if that makes sense. If anyone needs clarity, just post it on the chat and I'll be able to clarify that further. <sighs> What is a limited or temporary grant? Uh, this is now where we talk about, this is where intermeddling tends to take place. So with a limited grant, it's called a limited grant for special purpose. So the special purpose can be school fees. It can be house rent, can be food. It can be paying for a nanny. It can be for filing a case in court for, on behalf of the estate of the person. Whatever the special purpose is, we need a limited grant. So it's a, it's a basic application made to court by way of some forms. The forms are also readily available. So you just fill out those forms and then you present it to court stating your specific purpose. So if the purpose is school fees or rent, you attach an invoice 
uh, a copy of the invoice and then the court will be able to give you that limited grant for that specific purpose. So anytime you need something from the court during the course of a succession process when someone has passed on, all you need to do is apply for a, a limited grant uh, for special purpose. And yes, it's also, it's called temporary. It's not limited or temporary. It's a limited grant for special purpose. It's temporary in nature. So it's temporary in that you cannot divide the, the estate in whole based on that special grant. It's just for one purpose. And courts are very sure it's the wording. So if it is only for school fees, then it's school fees only. So you'll not be able to withdraw also for house rent. Um, this grant is presented to a bank, perhaps where you need to withdraw the money from, and they'll be able to facilitate that particular issue until, you know, the as per the order of the court. The next thing is about family trust. Now, this is very interesting because it's quite lengthy. So I'll just try and summarize family trust as much as I can. So um, these are made for the benefit of beneficiaries. So it's not a will. Trusts are very different even in, uh, in setting up. Uh, wills, you just write out your wishes and then you, you make sure you've complied with the rules so that now it's valid. With regard to a trust, there's the aspect of regist uh, registration of the trust. So you draw up the, what is called the trust deed that sets out what it is that you want done. And then you register the trust deed and then it's later incorporated. And now with a trust, you have four trustees. With a will, you have two uh, executors. It's a whole uh, complex process, uh, but it's um, worthwhile for these reasons. With a will, after you've divided your property, um, you'll find that that particular generation, your children or your beneficiaries in that line can misuse whatever it is that they've been bequeathed. With a trust, they don't get everything at once. What tends to happen is they're given piecemeal. So you can get a monthly stipend or a monthly, it's called income. Every month they get something, so from the family trust. The caution about a family trust or any trust for that matter you must get an advocate involved. The technicality in drafting a trust deed will determine whether one, when you die as a beneficiary of the trust, it ends with you, not your wife or your children will benefit. Or you can have what is called a family trust that is in perpetuity. So then your children and your spouse get the income as though you are still alive. Um, it's a very complex uh, concept. But it's once it's been incorporated, the benefit is that with that piecemeal uh, income for each beneficiary, your estate outlives a second and third generation if the value of the estate is that wide. So what we advise our clients to do with regard to creation of family trusts to ensure that what you have worked for outlives the first generation, leave some of it for the will so that it goes through probate. And then in your will, states that you have a trust that you are have incorporated. Now in that trust, have majority of your assets uh, in the trust, transferred into the trust so that now it begins to earn income for those generations. Um, we will be ready uh, to answer any questions with regard to trust. It's, it's a bit complex, the whole uh, topic altogether, uh, but uh, we're ready to answer those questions. Next slide, please. So, um, Harris, you were to take on the first uh, few. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you so much, Mimi. Uh, I think for purposes of emphasis, the last comment that uh, Mimi talked about regarding tr uh, trust, that's, it's a place that very few have uh, considered. Uh, predominantly, it's the rich families in this town that have been able to do that, uh, but, Lots of the middle class and uh, upper middle class have not yet fully grasped the concept of trust, but it, it would be one of those things that would resolve a lot of the challenges that are happening. If perhaps you guys are already having conversations within your families regarding uh, what to do with the property of your parents once the person, please consider the idea of trust. And lately certain entities have uh, uh, developed a product whereby uh, you know you can have part of your estate in a trust. It can gain income 
and that income can be distributed to your beneficiaries. That is to say, God forbid you're to pass on, your children will be paid fees for by this entity. Uh, if your surviving spouse will always receive some kind of, for lack of a better way to put it, pocket change, you know, that comes in on a monthly basis. So it's a, and trusts are very simple. They are very, very simple and a very brilliant concept of managing estates. And I can tell you for a fact that who is who, I will not mention names. Uh, some of those generational families that we know in this country, that is what they have used. And more reason why you don't hear a lot of fights. Yeah, because trusts are very clear. And uh, I won't get into detail. If you want more details, you'll have to get in touch with either me or Mimi, and we shall elaborately uh, break it down for you. Of course, at a small fee. Um, regarding the general questions on wills. But before I get there, there's a question that normally comes up. And it's a question to do with a sibling who has a disability. So sometimes you, you have people ask, if my brother has autism, are they entitled to, um, you know, to a part of the estate? Yes, they are entitled to a part of the estate and there's a procedure to it where you have to apply to court to be a representative, to be their representative in, 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 uh, in regards to the estate division so that their portion is uh, uh, given to you to hold in custody for them. That aside, the first question, people are hesitant to write wills for they feel it's a death sentence. This is very common, very, very common, but we need to demystify it. We need to look at it more as a prudent act. Yeah, life requires you and I to be very prudent in resources, in our lives, we plan ahead. And one of the ways you have to plan ahead, if you love your wife and your children that much, please plan ahead by putting it in writing. You don't want uncles and some crazy aunties knocking down the door and then, you know, literally robbing your family of what you have toiled and worked so hard for. We plan for many things. One of the things we, I find we don't plan for, which is very important, is we never plan for death. It's important because it's imminent, it's bound to happen. And you and I are not custodians of our own lives. And we may not have that all oh, long sickness, like you know, some people unfortunately you know, go through before they die. It could be instant. So then what happens? What happens to that, uh, you know, that small shamba you have in, uh, in Kajado, you know? Or, or somewhere along Gong Road, or come on, consider writing a will. It's not a death sentence. Uh, what beneficiaries are required to? What are bene, What benefit? What are beneficiaries required to do once, once, the one who wrote the will dies? What beneficiaries are required to do is that if they know of an existing will, they need to get in touch with a person who has that will or the executor. If the executor, if they are aware that maybe the, the will is in custody at the public trustee or certain lawyer has it, they are to get in touch with that person. And then uh, the executor's role and responsibility is to proceed to court to have that will validated. And then once it is validated, then the estate is divided or distributed as per the wishes of the deceased. In the event that uh, the beneficiaries are not aware of any existing will, what do they do? They, they proceed to advisedly, I would say, get a, you know, I would, I would advise them to get a lawyer. But you admit there are some people who are hardcore, who are willing to take it on their own. Eh? Yes, you have to file the requisite documents, file a petition, uh, affidavits from you know guarantees, and then attach, of course, a letter from the, uh, from the chief and all those other documents that my colleague Mimi earlier. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. And attach all those other documents that my colleague uh, um, highlighted that need to be attached 
when you're applying for letters of administration. Can one put verified social media? Huh? Can one put verified social media accounts in a wheel? Yes. We live in very interesting times. If you have Bitcoin, yes. Include it as well. Those social media accounts, make sure that as you include them in the wheel, you include things like passwords, you know, and so on and so forth. Because as we, as we are lately, uh, you know, one or two of you could be influencers and you've been making money off social media. Or maybe you're on, uh, Inst on YouTube that pays, you know, depending on the viewership of your videos and so on and so forth, please consider it. In any intellectual properties that you have, please uh, include them in a will. It's very, very important. Times are changing. Times are radically changing. So some of those uh, should, not some of them, but all those should be included in the will. Um, my, uh, the last one before I call on Mimi to come aboard. If the deceased had loans and property is being held, how can beneficiaries access the estate? The first thing, like I said earlier on, uh, what the beneficiaries need to do, the beneficiaries need to proceed and validate uh, the wills, if there is a will. If there's no will, they'll have to include it in, in their documents of submission that these properties are being held as security in the, in the banks. If they don't have a copy of the, of the title, uh, which, is in, which is necessary to be attached, you can engage the bank as beneficiaries, uh, tell the bank that you know, you're going to apply for letters of administration, Therefore, it's important to have this, a copy of this document, of this title highlighted in, uh, in, you know, in your petition for letters of administration. And once the letters of administration are issued or once uh, the validation of the will is uh, eventually you know, given, then that estate or whoever has been allocated that property or even as a family, you take on the responsibility of clearing that loan uh, depending on the terms and conditions therein. Um, Mimi, would you want to jump in and uh, perhaps answer any other questions or that uh, are listed here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I take on the next, who can inherit? So your dependents can inherit from your estate. Um, there's a section of the Succession Act that talks about who can inherit. Um, so there's wives or former wives of the deceased. So with or without a settlement. And I say that because if in your will, you still loved your former wife and you decide that she gets to inherit something from your estate, you can set that out insofar as you do not prejudice your current wife or wives. Um, so if you have already a settlement, um, then it's not an entitlement that you will get uh, to inherit from the estate of the deceased person. Then there's the husband to the deceased if he was being maintained by her immediately prior to her death. So it has to be immediately prior to her death. Um, then there is children, whether maintained by the deceased immediately prior to his death or her death or not. And this is because you have the children that you uh, walk around with the people, the children that are known, and then you have those that are not known uh, by people. You know what I'm talking about. So they, if they came about and they said that they uh, need to inherit from your estate, then the court will readily grant that insofar as they can prove that they are dependents of your estate or beneficiaries. So dependents meaning they are already benefiting in terms of they're depending on your estate as it is. And then beneficiaries being, these are children who've never really gotten anything from you. But if the woman somewhere or the man somewhere claims this is your child and a DNA test is done and they are proven to have been your child or are your child then, or children, then they can inherit from your estate, whether you knew about them or not, whether you uh, agreed to taking care of them or not. So this includes children born out of wedlock or children, uh, yeah, children born out of wedlock. Yes. Um, then also your parents, 
uh, step parents, it's a long list, uh, Harris mentioned it earlier, grandparents, grandchildren, stepchildren, adopted children, by legal adoption or not, brothers and sisters, half brothers, half sisters, and so on and so forth. As long as they were being maintained by you, so it's not a blank check, uh, they have to have been maintained by you. So those are the people you can inherit. There's a whole section even about the priority of how they get to inherit, and the priority of how they get to file in case um, you die intestate or uh, the court declares that your will is not valid. There's a whole list of priority on how who gets to file for letters of administration. So an uncle from nowhere cannot come and file for letters of administration intestate before your spouse does. The court will not readily grant that uh, application. Can the will maker disinherit children or spouses when they notice we're stage while still alive? Then the question becomes, why did you do nothing about it while you were still alive? Because that was the window of opportunity for you to do something. And the something can be transferring assets into a trust. And because a trust does not give a specific provision of distribution of their estate among beneficiaries, it just says your beneficiaries may be anybody, it can be blood relatives or not, it doesn't have to be equal distribution of your estate among them. So it's important for you to consider trust as um, Harris mentioned, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you notice wastage while you're still alive and you opt not to do anything, the court will enforce the various sections of the Succession Act that provide for equitable distribution of your estate among your beneficiaries. Beneficiaries and dependents being your spouse and your children, whether they were wasting your estate or not. So stay woke. Must the husband prove he was dependent on the wife to inherit? Unfortunately, yes. In the same way, wives lose an inheritance in their estate when they remarry. So the law is quite unfair that way um, to both parties, uh, but you have to prove that you are dependent, not just that you are um, a spouse. Um, in the same way, if you come up with children, you come and say, I had children with Harris, then I have to come with a DNA sample proving that indeed Harris is the father. Now, this is something that now is very rampant, uh, I must say. Um, more and more people are being forced to take DNA tests to prove uh, paternity, mostly it's paternity. So it's just something to be aware of. So yes, the husband must prove he was dependent on the wife to inherit. But both husband, um, both spouses of a deceased person must attach proof of marriage being the first step. So that then begs the question with regard to uh, what if we didn't register our marriage? The court gives room for what is called presumption of marriage, but you have to you have to show evidence that a marriage in your heart of hearts existed. Now the Marriage Act came into place to curb all of this, so that now people are forced to register their marriages. Of course, there are those who to date. I hope there's none in the chat. Those ones are not in the chat today. Everyone here has registered their marriage, be it a traditional one, which by the way, as per the Marriage Act is polygamous, or you've registered a civil one, in which case um, it is monogamous or a church uh, wedding, which, a marriage uh, which is monogamous. So with that a certificate, you then attach it to your petition for letters of administration interstate or your petition for grant of probate with written will. Um, as one of the first points, when you're identifying yourself, I am the one filing this petition as so-and-so to the deceased person. So you'll say as the husband uh, of this person or as the wife of this person, having been married on dash day of dash 2021 or 1990 or whichever year and date of your marriage. And then you now in brackets attached is your marriage certificate. So it's uh, and you write the serial number as well and you attach it. These are things that are also proved in court. If you say you have children, you also attach their birth certificates uh, showing that he is the father. Uh, if they are adopted and there's a legal adoption, you attach, attach the adoption certificate. If you're claiming that they were never legally adopted, then you attach some kind of evidence showing that there was a consistent presence of them in your life. For example, photographs showing, you know, they're in the family photos and all that. Can a daughter-in-law whose husband has died inherit from their father-in-law upon his passing also? You know, uh, 
these are some of those Kantakara uh, characters. You want to inherit everywhere. You know, you want to inherit from your father, your spouse, your father-in-law, your mother-in-law, your mother, your sister-in-law. You can't inherit everywhere. Just be a good Christian and inherit where, you know, you live. Inherit from your father, uh, because the law says daughters cannot be disinherited. Inherit from your mother. Inherit from your spouse. You know, when you go that far, in so far as if your father-in-law had a written will, and he stated expressly in his written will that his property devolves to his son, who is now this lady's husband, and the husband passes on, it first forms part of his the husband's estate. She can inherit in that manner, but not directly um, inheriting from the father-in-law. In any case, the court has full discretion on these matters. So on a case-by-case -case basis, they may be able to look at her matter and say, no, you have no standing here. You cannot inherit in this situation. Or they might have compassion and say, okay, your family is struggling. You can inherit from, from this estate. Go and look at the case of um, SK Masharia. Uh, he lost a battle with his uh, grandson over the estate of his son. That should tell you something. And that's not a far relation. You can't just go stretching your arms to try and reach out everywhere. Just be content with what you have. Um, I think that that would be my two cents on that. With that, we wrap up our presentation. I hope that we have covered as much as possible. Yeah. In any case, Maybe. we're looking forward to more of your questions. Yeah. Uh, you've not addressed. Uh, you've not addressed the issue of um, uh, what's ah. the What's <laughs> the but so, do, 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 are, guys, pangu, do, are guys also pangwa candles? Because lately there's also a trend where, yeah, you know, pangwa candles are not just ladies, you know, side in another in, in another country they call them side dishes. But you also mm -hmm. have guys, you know, who are pangwa candles for rich women, eh? who are yes. poor. Uh, mm. Yes, well, side babies, they're yeah, called. Um, so what happens to side babies? Um, Justice Musinga called all of them, Susie, come lately. Uh, what happens to all of them? Uh, they have no right to come claiming things. Um, you chose to be a side plate. Side plates are stored on the side for a reason. Um, so legally speaking, now that was just my, what is called my opinion, my orbiter. However, legally speaking, if you're not a wife, uh, if you're not a child, then you're not a dependent, strictly speaking. Mm. So you cannot come and claim from the estate of a deceased person. Now, what if the Susie come lately or the child ba side baby uh, decide uh, are have been added into the will of a deceased person? This has happened before and the wills have been challenged on those grounds. Um, you can challenge the will, by the way, if you find a side baby or a Susie uh, have been added into the will. But the court, okay, again, has discretion with regard to the wishes of a deceased person. Now, if it's not in a written will and uh, she doesn't have a child, then she cannot inherit from the estate. If she has a child, however, yeah. Um, or if a little Johnny has a child uh, with the lady, then that's a different ball game altogether. The Constitution and the Children's Act and the Law of Succession Act protects the children whether they are born out of wedlock with Susie or Johnny. So all those children will have to be provided for. But Susie and Johnny, not necessarily. All right. Um, I think there's a question here that is coming in from Faith. She says, does having a will, a will in marriage mean that the marriage laws will be suspended? Maybe if I do not leave my spouse anything in my will, but I leave everything to the children. But the law says that all things gotten after marriage is owned equally by the couple. So I think what Faith is doing, she's mixing um, matrimonial, matrimonial property, property and, uh, with yes. the law of succession. Now, yes. Faith, let me clarify uh, for you. Matrimonial Properties Act will not apply in succession disputes in any way, shape, or form. That mm. only applies when both parties are alive and they're able to dispute. Uh, you cannot dispute with a dead person over your marriage, yeah? Um, so you, you have to dispute over those property aspects when they're alive. Now, just to clarify on the MPA, the Matrimonial Properties Act provides in Section 14, rightfully so, that if you, when one spouse obtains property uh, in marriage in their name, 
or in their deed, it is presumed that they have obtained that property in trust for the other spouse in a 50-50 ratio. But yes. that is a presumption. Now, when you go to court, you have to prove, uh, or what's the word? Um, contribution. Okay? Contribution. So mm. Once you have to prove contribution, then that ratio tends to tip the balance. Not only yeah. will you have to prove contribution in a matrimonial properties dispute, but you'll also have to prove the aspect of was it sole or intended as sole ownership or joint ownership. So if I prove that I bought it for myself, then it's sole ownership. We cannot share it in a matrimonial properties dispute at yeah. all. It's untouchable property. Yes. Now, any property that we have finished in a dispute of matrimonial properties uh, under the Matrimonial Properties Act, does not form the basis of um, assets of a deceased person that a former spouse can come to claim. Once that dispute has been settled by the courts, a former spouse can therefore not come claiming a second portion of your estate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that clarifies that. So unless in your written will, you have said, I care for John, I want John to get a car that we once shared sweet memories together. Then aside from that, then John cannot come saying that, you know, we were married and therefore the act in section 29 says that yeah. as a former spouse, I am entitled to. No, the court will look at that particular case and say on a case by case basis, if John's dispute was sorted out in a matrimonial properties dispute, yes. then John cannot claim anything. However, if John and Mary had children, then the children of John and Mary, despite the fact that they divorced and had a matrimonial properties cause that was determined, the children must inherit. I yeah. hope I have covered that substantially. Yes, I, I, I think you have. I think you have, because I keep getting that question uh, lately. I think even in the previous presentations, we had a situation where uh, a lady, I think, said, you know what, I've, my husband has not contributed anything to the, uh, to, you know, to the assets that I own. We have been married together, but he has never contributed anything to the assets. So, and I want that upon my demise, that everything that I've been able to accumulate goes to my children and not his, uh, and not him or not to his uh, uh, previous, his yeah, his, not his previous spouse, but children from a different or previous marriage. What would you mm -hmm. tell such a person? You cannot divorce, your spouse in our will. You cannot disinherit your spouse or your children in your will. You will mm. have to contend with those issues when you're alive because mm. once you're gone, the law of succession act applies as it is, not yes. as you intend it to be. Yes. Um, we apply the law as it is, not mm. what your wishes were, not what your, what your intentions were. In so far as the LSA still says that wives, former wives, uh, mm -hmm. without a, that is in quotes, without a settlement. The act actually does not set out the without a settlement mm -hmm. part. It's mm -hmm. something we prove in court. Um, so former husbands, children, whether maintained by the deceased or not, parents, step parents, if that is what the act says, then that is what we shall do as per statute. So you cannot write and say, we have disagreed bitterly, and therefore I think my husband should inherit nothing. Um, the court will invalidate that will very, very quickly and bequeath upon him that which is a due share to him, equitable yeah. distribution of the assets of the deceased. So they look at the estate, the net estate of the deceased, then they look at the loans that need to be paid to the creditors. The creditors are very important people, even with the yes. bankruptcy, bankruptcy cases, they're very important. They come in and their share is deducted and then now from the net estate, who gets what? Um, yes. And that's what is looked at here. Yeah. Yeah. Personal feelings aside, we do get a lot of these yes. personal, very emotive mm. cases. But the yes. fact is, emotions aside, the law says the law X, stuff. Y, Z. Mm -hmm. We have to comply with what the law says. Yes, because I've had a similar situation where the mother, uh, uh, a mother to adult, said, "You know what? All this property is mine. I, you know, together with your deceased father, we worked so hard. So you guys are not getting a share." But uh, the law is very clear. You cannot disinherit children. Mm -hmm. And uh, what as a spouse, a surviving spouse, you, can, you are only entitled to as a right is, um, it's, it's um, 
what's the word? I'm forgetting the word. Surviving spouses are given, hmm? the wife is given, the, the surviving spouses. Household goods, absolutely. The life, and the life interest, the life interest, yeah. the life yeah. interest of the estate. So, yeah. So that's it. I think uh, our presentation is done. I, I don't know if this is a question. Let me see. Uh, Angela says, thank you for the enlighten, for enlightening us. Mimi and Harris, my question is about administrators. How far is far? Uh, how far is far in the kind of decisions they make, considering those mentioned in the will? Have that uh, have have like their own title deeds in this case? If it's land, I I can't seem to understand what you're saying, Angela. I don't know if you can. Perhaps you can come online and ask the question. Oh, yeah. Angela, if you're, if you're there, just unmute yourself and then ask your question, please. Okay, it's a bit, um, it's, it's um, oh, okay. She's, uh, I think they will uh, they'll send further information. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, any other, uh, any other questions? Uh, Ronald, do you have questions? Yeah, I think um, I just want to appreciate uh, both of you. Um, I really admire being able to sustain the session for that long. I know talking for that period of time, I also have my own hot water here. It's not easy talking for a long period of time like that. So I really want to uh, thank you for being able to sustain that discussion for that length of time. And um, I can see even from uh, the, the, the attendance in the office, uh, we still have a good number of uh, uh, staff who are listening in. It has been really informative. Um, I was not expecting the outline was going to be that exhaustive, but I've seen, uh, you know, you've really done, 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 done as well. And of course, for any follow-up questions, uh, my colleagues can feel free to uh, share with me uh, in confidence, of course, and I can forward them to our speakers. But for now, I'd like to request us to uh, maybe unmute your mics or even using the reaction icons in the chat. Just appreciate our speakers uh, with, a, with a round of applause and even for giving their time. So uh, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's just appreciate our guests, please. Yeah, I can see uh, there's a comment even from, um, I'm just reading the, the, the chat briefly as, as, as we conclude. Uh, I've seen also we have uh, our general sales manager who is uh, in attendance. Uh, thanks for making the time. He's also working on something else, but he's managed to join. I'd seen our CEO also in attendance at one point in time. Uh, so I really want to thank uh, both our, our speakers as well as uh, our, our guests, uh, you know, for making this time. So I think uh, at this point, I'm going to stop the recording.